Welcome to Will Radio Part 4, Books and Vision. This is my only video today, at least so far. Um, been busy day due to backlog. Had a NIH-related, mm, I don't know what to call it. They call it a relay, a four-day event, which was very intense. And this week I was doing videos and also trying to catch up on other things, so just had a big backlog of things to take care of and kind of tired, but no problem. I um, have done some of the work I need to do today and I'll probably do some more before I go to sleep, but today is a one video day, but I did want to put one video up on the scoreboard. I, you know, even if it's a short one, I would like to, to at least do one video a day. Uh, my energy level is good, I would say, for my one kilo tube challenge. You know, today is just kind of tired just because I had a lot a lot to do and, you know, been staying up late uh, doing fun things. But I don't feel like I'm getting burned out. I feel very energetic. I'm someone who gets more burned out when I'm not doing something I care about, whereas this is fun and challenging. So, yeah. I don't, and I never get tired of talking. Anyone knows me, never get tired of talking, especially about myself. So I don't think I'm going to get burned out like that. As long as I talk about things I care about and keep it fun, you know, as long as it's not serious. If it's serious, then I can get burned out, right? But that's the whole point of this is to, to not overthink everything. Uh, will radio is fun. You know, <laughs> I guess part of it is, you know, part of the, the good thing about having to make so many videos is like I wanted to make a whole bunch of videos one day. And I'm like, I'm not sure what to make. Uh, how about I invent Will Radio, which was inspired by um, a Jap uh, Japanese, you know, sort of video podcast shows for anime where they'll say, OK, you know, the new anime series. And then they'll have the voice actors or say you have a radio show, they call it. And so those are very popular in Japan. So it's like, all right, I'll do Will Radio. Um, so that was just a fun idea. It's like, all right, uh, I don't know. Just the format seems to fit me well. I, I, I've got this nice microphone. It looks like a professional studio mic uh, on this big arm. So it kind of feels like I'm in, I'm in the booth, you know, doing something important, but it's just fun. So uh, I don't know. That just seems... Uh, Easy for me to do. I think I could do infinitely many Will Radio episodes without any problem. Uh, Discord is also fun. Got a lot of people signed up for Discord. Got some very interesting conversations starting to happen. I'm learning a lot. That's what I thought would happen is, you know, find find the people who are interested in these things, right? Just like kind of, uh, it's almost like a stone soup type thing. If you know the stone soup story, you know, it's like a place around which uh, there's, there's like a fireplace and some soup for people to come and bring ingredients. So I didn't know it's happened so quickly, but it's definitely happening. So that's fun. Um, okay, so tomorrow is February 1st. And tomorrow the real writing begins on the first of 11 books. And that'll be fun. I've decided that I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself in terms of thinking of follow-up books. So I've decided on the second book. The second book's going to be uh, The Most Beautiful Program Ever Written. And I thought, well, maybe I should push that to the end, you know, where I have more experience. And maybe that would make sense. But I think at the same time, that's sort of defeating the entire purpose, which is the nothing precious attitude, which uh, Kelly Toki, an artist I know, that's the name of one of her books is Nothing Precious. So I want to keep the Nothing Precious perspective and just write. You know, just write, 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 write. No uh, overthinking. Apple Vision Pro. It's not like I don't know enough about that program, right? I mean, you know, it's like, it's like I've been living and breathing that program for so long. You know, I could just do something based on the talk I gave. So I, no reason to overthink it. I'm going to try to underthink it and you know have the courage to do something bad or what that my favorite phrase from ed wood which is my next one will be better so that's fine 
Uh, Apple Vision Pro. I will admit I was a little curious about that thing. Now that it looks like it's about to come out. And I saw some videos. Mm, I'm more I'm more interested. I have to say I'm much more interested now in it. Even though it looks like it's got a lot of problems. It does. It looks like one of these futuristic sci-fi things. I tried a, a number of those new headsets uh, years ago. I wasn't very impressed with any of them. And even though this one looks like has a number of compromises and design trade-offs, it looks good enough to be maybe the first one that's tempted me. So um, I've got a couple reasons why it's tempting. One is, you know, I've spent a little bit of time writing apps uh, for Mac OS, like Barlamin as a Mac OS app. And so I learned a little you know, Swift or whatever. I'm very bad at it, extremely bad at it. And I played around a very small amount with iPhone development. It's like, I barely know any of this stuff. Um, but I can imagine myself actually writing an app or something for the Vision Pro, even if it's just for myself. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the Vision Pro for data visualization. I mean, this really looks like it's kind of a snow crash hero protagonist, uh, or the eighties, you know, all of the virtual reality stuff in terms of data visualization and manipulation and things like mini Canron search trees. I've wanted to visualize those. I've seen visualizations of them, but you know, like, huh, maybe, maybe there's something there that w would be possible, um, with the new medium, uh, things like proof trees, you know, that kind of thing. Also biomedical knowledge graphs. So in MediCanron, we're dealing with these large biomedical knowledge graphs we're getting from other teams. And some of them are huge. We want to run different algorithms on them. And, you know, you can use standard visualization, but I feel like the 3D might be a good way to do it. And then there are things like cell biology and looking at proteins and cell walls and all those sorts of visualizations that really are three-dimensional. It's hard to imagine you know, the 2D projections of those, I think. Um, and then another interest of mine, and this has driven a lot of my interest, is that, you know, I've been having, you know, I've never had great eyesight, but I've haven't been having more um, problems with my eyesight recently. I've got cataracts in both eyes, and I've had retinal problems uh, starting a few years ago. I always knew I'd be a danger of that because I have Extreme, I'm extremely nearsighted, and so that means my retinas are thinner, and you can get tears and bleeding and so forth. And a couple of years ago, I got some bleeding in my right eye, and it just happened to be sort of apparently accidentally, uh, I guess I got lucky, it happened to be in my fovea. And uh, so I lost you know, a, a fair amount of my really high-resolution vision in my right eye. And when I uh, looked at the scan, so there's this optical computed tomography scans, uh, OCTs or like CAT scans, but instead of x-rays they're using lasers to, to image uh, the retina. Um, the, the amazing thing is you can actually see the different layers of the retina and, and uh, the, the shape of it. So there are 3D scans, high resolution 3D scans of both of my retinas and both of my fovea. And so the, you know, the, um, uh, physicians were showing me different, the ophthalmologists were showing me uh, comparison images. And as I understand their explanation, it's largely a geometrical problem uh, for my right eye. So there's the fovea normally looks like this little pit um, in, in the retina. And I don't exactly understand how that works, but that's my understanding of it. It looks like this little pit. And in my fovea on my right eye, it's more like there's like a dimple pushing up, you know, so, so the shape, um, you know, changed, the geometry changed. And when I was looking at those images, I was, I was wondering, huh, I wonder if this is really more like a focusing problem, if it'd be possible to do something like a corrective lens. If you remember the Hubble Space Telescope, how that, you know, the famously the mirror was, um, made very, very precisely, but to the wrong shape. And there was a shuttle mission that was able to install basically glasses for the Hubble Space Telescope. The The issue, I think, is that 
the shape of of my uh, fovea is somewhat irregular and you know so it's this irregular shape i think would be hard to compensate i don't know you could compensate with it with normal lenses but i was thinking well if you had something computational if you could do like computational photo photography type things or if you could do like fft's and convolutions and deconvolutions and you know all the sorts of image manipulation you know maybe there's some way you know light field photography and you know if you look at confocal microscopy and scanning confocal microscopy and all the OCT technology i wonder if there's a way to you know sort of computationally or or in terms of physics modeling you know, like predict what the uh, aberration would be as far as you know how you would have to change the image going into the retina or going into the eye going into the lens of the eye uh, in order to correct for that, like, would that be possible? I don't know. So uh, that that's something I'm very curious about. I wonder if it'd be possible. Now, I don't know if Apple is going to expose this sort of, sort of thing through their APIs. I wouldn't be surprised if they if they don't. But 90 frames per second high resolution with the pass through, you know, I could imagine something where there's actually correction to the image based on the eye tracking where you know somehow the image is is blurred for part of the image in such a way that it would correct for the distortion in the shape of my fovea whether or not that would work i don't know i think there might be some way to test that by the way um just on a regular you know laptop screen if i'm just staring at one dot maybe there are ways to to um, shift around uh, part of the image, and maybe I can do some sliders or something to try to correct to see if that even makes sense. Uh, I'm not sure. Or maybe it has to be sort of like running a confocal microscope backwards or light field photography. You know, maybe the, the rays have to come in at exactly the right angle or have to be scanned, you know, to make sure that only that part of the fovea is uh, getting the image and you're not getting scattering. I don't know, but it, it seems that today the technology is starting to exist where that might be possible. And I told this to my friend Cam, who's like the ultimate gearhead. And, uh, you know, we started talking about it a little bit and he found this uh, PNAS, PNAS paper, I don't know how you pronounce it, PNAS paper, optimizing virtual reality for all users through gauge con gaze contingent and adaptive focus displays. That's open access. Um, and I guess one of the things that's interesting here, uh, these displays can be tailored to correct common refractive errors and provide natural focus cues by dynamically updating the system based on where a user looks in a virtual scene and this is a sentence that makes me inter interested. Indeed, the opportunities afforded by recent advances in computational optics open up the possibility of creating a computing platform in which some users may experience better quality vision in the virtual world than in the real world. And with the Apple, or not just the Apple, but with like, you know, AR style. Actually, I don't think you want AR style. I don't think you want the the light pass through directly. I think what Apple has with the pass through or another type of goggle with the pass through would be more like it where there's a chance to do some image, image processing, but it's still low latency. Apple claims 12 milliseconds or something. Um, it's still low enough latency that, that it's tolerable. Uh, but where you, where there's a chance to do some computational stuff. I don't know if you can do stuff with shaders or, you know, I don't know anything about these areas, but uh, I'd like to learn about it and play around with it. I've, I have a couple of friends who are who have a lot of experience with shaders and you know computational stuff and graphics stuff. So anyway, just curious what people think about that. It seems like people are starting to explore this technology. So this this paper is like seven years old now, um, and you know here's a paper from 2022 on foveated rendering, state of the art. So dynamic foveated rendering, I guess, is when, you know, your eye is tracked and 
So you have some high resolution screen for virtual reality where where you look on the screen, that gets rendered with extra detail and then your peripheral vision gets less detail. So that's that technology has existed uh, for quite a while now. And so I would want a dynamic foveated rendering where for part of the fovea, there's some, I don't know if it's convolutions or deconvolutions or I don't, I don't know what the terminology is or what the exact thing would be, but somehow compensating for the shape of my eye. And I can imagine, you know, getting those 3D scans and even having like a computational physics model to figure out, you know, how how the image would need to be changed to compensate for the shape of uh, my fovea. Anyway, that interests me enough that uh, I did check my bank account today. So I don't know if I can Apple Vision Pro or not, but um, it's sorely tempting just to play around with it. It does feel like a new interface uh, paradigm, which is also something I'm super interested in. Obviously, it's not the first type of goggles, but just like the iPhone, right? There were lots of phones around and there were lots of computers around before the Macintosh. And of course the Macintosh wasn't brand new. Uh, it was um, inspired by lots of other uh, previous work, but still made a big, big uh, change in how people interact with computers. So this one feels the same to me, even though it's first gen and it's expensive and all that, and has kind of ridiculous trade-offs in some ways. I'm really tempted, so we'll see. Um, okay, that's it. Uh, tomorrow, I'll start the book for real, and we'll go from there. And this weekend, I'll probably catch up on episodes, probably catch up on the episodes largely from doing a lot of writing. That'd be my guess. Um, but I'll try to get in three day, uh, three uppies the next two days if... Uh, if I get a shot in my eye for my retina, which might happen sometime soon, because I get those periodically, um, that might be a, a little bit of a tough day to do anything uh, serious, but you know, maybe I'll do a low-impact Will Radio for that day. All right, talk to you soon. Thanks.